Hi, this is Dick DeAngelis, director of the Fairfield History Series. Today, we're going to share with you our interview with Jonathan Buffalo, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Meskwaki Tribe. Jonathan was, is really a brilliant guy and very kind and giving of his time with us. This was the, then used in the Life Before Fairfield film, the first we did in the Fairfield History Series. You're going to actually get to to hear about the history of these wonderful and amazing people directly from, I think, one of the experts, the top experts on the Meskwaki tribe. So enjoy. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope you get as much out of this as we got when we went to visit Jonathan Buffalo. <music> The Meskwakis are very traditional. We have been fortunate to live in a traditional way longer than most tribes because of our lifestyle. Clear up to World War II, we still lived in a village winter camp setting where we would, during winter, go out to our winter camps across Iowa. Well, most tribes were confined to their reservations. So we're fortunate in that it kept us culturally relevant to ourselves. We may not be the same people because we dress different. We eat different foods, but in certain ways, we are those same people. If our ancestors came to see us today, they would recognize us. They would think we're kind of strange. They would think we're kind of dumb in certain ways, knowledge-wise, you know. But they would still recognize us as Meskwakis. They would say our grandchildren are pretty dumb in certain ways, but they're our grandchildren. You know, they would so in that sense, us Meskwakis were, were an ancient people in a modern world. When my wife and I came to work this morning, we drove our car. We didn't walk, we didn't saddle the horse. We drove our car and took us a couple minutes to come to work. We watched TV just like everybody else, but in another sense, our ancientness is still alive through our ceremonies, through our beliefs, our identity is that ancientness is still there with us. Yes, we have changed, but we're still those same people. The language is Algonquin. We speak an Algonquin language and our dialect our dialect of Algonquin is the Great Lakes region. And we speak a dialect, what's in linguists say is uh, Sac, Fox, and Kikabu. Those three tribes, we speak a certain dialect of Algonquin. We like to think we're the metal, the metal, how we talk. The Sac people talk slower, and uh, the Kikabu, our relative tribe, they speed up the language a little bit. So we're, we think we're the metal, we speak a medium, but we speak Algonquin. And we understand somewhat Chippewas, Potawatomi's, Miami's. Then there's the Eastern Algonquin tribes. We understand a little bit. Then there's the Western Algonquin tribes, like Arapaho, Cheyenne, Blackfoot. We kind of, kind of understand them. And the language is still 
strong. The language is still taught at home. Just by talking to your children, to your grandchildren. But it is also taught at the school as a language. You know, so that's they learn kids learn it both ways. Right now we're living at the western edge of our environment. So when in eighteen forty five when we were removed to Kansas and on the map it's just a short distance, but it's another environment and our children were dying, we were hungry, we were homesick. So we decided to come back into this area. And it wouldn't have worked 10 years earlier, and it wouldn't have worked 10 years later. It's that magic moment of the 1850s, pre-Civil War, states' rights, and Two things happened that made it possible. The first people we met, the first Americans, were American-born from Kentucky, Pennsylvania, from those areas that have been pushing Indians westward for at least 100 years. So when they came into Iowa, the result was the Black Hawk War. So when they said move, we moved. And we ended up in Kansas. But when, by the 1850s, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin was filling up with immigrants from Northern Europe, Germany, Danes, Norwegians, from that area. German, Germanic speaking people mostly. And we met those people and their first instinct wasn't to shoot first. It was curiosity. We were curious. We, we met another type of European. We've, we have met the French. We met the English. We met the Spanish and later Mexicans. But these people were different. We knew they were European, but different. And they had real full whiskers, you know, beards. And when they talked, their whiskers would move, you know. So we call them uh, catfish people, you know, because their whiskers would move when they talked. So we learned a little German, they learned a little Meskwaki. And by that time, counties, townships, cities, towns were developing and politics was developing. So they became political leaders. And when we needed them in 1856 to pass that law, allowing us to remain in Iowa, it was passed. And the following year, we purchased the first 80 acres. Because in the 1840s, when they were coming in, 1850s, these were new people. And we were here to help them. We helped develop, deliver babies. We told them how to do things, you know. So they were grateful. So when 10 years later, they repaid us with that political act. And like I said, it wouldn't have worked 10 years before, in, in 1847, because they wanted us gone physically gone, and in 1867, it wouldn't have worked because by then, the federal government was more powerful because of Lincoln and how, you know, how federal government developed. It became more powerful, and the federal government wanted us in Kansas. In the 1850s, they couldn't force us to go to Kansas, and in the meantime, we became landowners. And Iowa has always been a good state for us. We safety. We've always felt safe in Iowa. It's when we go out of our borders 
that it gets kind of dicey with us as Indians. Because as you go west, it gets more racist. As you go east, it gets more racist. But in Iowa, we've always felt safe. While Iowa was allowing a tribe to buy land, California, at the same time, in the 1850s, were paying $1 million for scalps. I don't know how much money that would be today, but that's the difference between Iowa and other states. That, that was a big difference. Sometimes we moved by choice. Sometimes we moved by being pushed. Sometimes we moved as conquerors. Sometimes we moved as refugees because we are so old that we, we have been conquerors and then we have been refugees in certain times of, in our history. So we love our settlement today. This is our home in central Iowa. And we can't think of any other home. But the Meskwakis that used to live along the Mississippi, that was their home. The Meskwakis that lived in Wisconsin, they fought and died for their home and they lost, which is us. We're the products of that defeat. And even if you go farther back, the Meskwakis that live, used to live in Michigan, Detroit, Saginaw Bay area, they loved their homes, but they had to move because of invasion. And going farther back into Ohio Valley, those Meskwakis loved those rivers and lakes and prairie. And you can go back to the far east into Lake St. John area, St. Lawrence River, River Valley. So every, every generation of Meskwakis had loved their home. But we're the Meskwakis today, and this is, Central Iowa is our home. And if you took a map and you looked at the Great Lakes watershed, Missis Mississippi Valley area, that's our bioregion. We have lived in that bioregion for thousands of years. We understand our bioregion. Our bioregion has four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Very extremes. If you've ever lived through an Iowa winter, you understand what I mean. And the summers are pretty hot. But that's our environment, and we have lived in that environment. We, we have learned how to live in it, which teaches, to live in our environment teaches you have to prepare. You have to get ready for the next season. If you were going into your winter quarters, you would have to have enough food to live through the winter. The object is to live through the winter into spring. So that, that was our way of life, is we would prepare for each season, season of change. But it's a very rewarding environment. We get to enjoy four seasons. But in some ways, it's the harshest environment. Because if you don't prepare without modern technology, without that little thing you move up and down for heat in your home, without that, you would have to have enough fuel. And if you ran out of fuel, you would possibly freeze. If you ran out of food, there would be no way for you to go outside in deep snow to get food, and you would starve. So it's a very, in some ways, it's a very harsh environment, but it's a very rewarding environment for us. And we've, we have lived in it for thousands of years. We know how to survive. People keep talking about the next ice age. 
we have lived through a couple ice ages as a people. So we're not afraid of an ice age because we would adapt to it. You know, individually, it might, some people might have it harder. But as a people, we would survive anything that comes down that road, climate change. We would survive that. I know it's a bad word, social, we're socialists in a certain sense because we hold our land in common. Nobody owns anything. And traditionally, we, we don't believe in private property, but we do have private property, you know. But in a tribal sense, everything belongs to everybody. But my axe is my axe. But if somebody wants to borrow it, they can just come and borrow it. And I assume that they're going to bring it back in that sense, you know. But if you think about it, the first, it's a bunch of little circles circling a bigger circle. The first dot is you, the individual. Then a circle is your family, your immediate family. Your, your mate, your children, your grandchildren. That's that circle. And then there's your extended family, your siblings and their children and their mates and everything. And then there's your bigger family that you belong to. Then you, there's another circle that goes around it which is your clan. Then a bigger circle is your tribe. Within that circle, circles, within circles, there's obligations to each thing, to your family. You should be good to your family, protect your children, provide for your children. And then you provide you have obligations to your extended family, then your clan, then your tribe. And then it works backwards too because the tribe has obligations to you, your clan has obligations to you and your extended family and your family. And the biggest example of that is every child, every Meskwaki child born inherits that right. He doesn't have to be converted to it. You're not introduced to it, but you're born with it. You're born, every Meskwaki child is born with the right to be Meskwaki, to have an Indian name, the right to participate in the ceremonial cycle of the tribe. And upon death, they have a right to have, to receive a decent burial. And it's in within that system that provides you with a decent burial. Your tribe buries you and take, takes care of your body and your soul. And that's how obligations go. They go up and down. You, you have obligations to the tribe, to your clan, to your family, and your tribe, clan, and family has obligations for you. Winter stories are like our morality stories, you know. Maybe a, the character steals, but somehow, in the end, he stealing didn't benefit him. Things like that, you know. And songs, secular and religious, you know, we have both. Our secular songs are more, they're almost like country music songs because they deal with emotion. They deal with emotion of love, 
wanting love, finding love, losing love, you know, things like that. Those are called uh, love songs, flute songs. And there's, of course, war songs, you know, get your blood going before you go to battle, you know. It's then religious songs that are spiritual, connects us to our, to our gods, you know. And the way we feel is that uh, religious songs are meant to be sung during a ceremony. They can't be sung out of context. For instance, I always, I always hear people play gospel music. To me, if you listen to your religious music too much, it just becomes music. It just becomes another form of music. It loses its value as spiritual music. They might think they're listening to spiritual music, but to me, it seems like it would, it would lose its power and just become music. Just another form of music, just like rap, you know, just like rock and roll. You know, when I hear it, it's just music to me. So religious songs are meant for a time and place. And when the ceremony ends, it ends. Whenever we do another ceremony, we're not reenacting a ceremony. We're doing another ceremony, and it's different. Everyone is different. It still looks the same, feels the same, but it's a different because we're, we're not reenacting our culture, our religion. We're doing our religion and our culture. We're living it. We're not reenacting it. We're not playing at it, but we're doing it. And sometimes, just like for me personally, there was a time when my mother was there. And then there came a time when my mother wasn't. So, do you understand what I mean? It's, we're not reenacting. When we do a ceremony, we're not reenacting the last one. We're doing our ceremony. You learn until you die, because you never know in everything. So you're always learning and understanding what you've just learned. When I used to go to ceremonies when I was a boy, I would hear the ceremony talk. I would imagine something else. And as I got older, I understood more. Then I thought, oh, that's what that means. Then maybe 10, 20 years later, I'm thinking, oh, that's what that means. I, it's a learning experience. So we don't expect our eight-year-olds to be profound when they go to ceremonies. We don't expect them to know. They should learn. The learning, it's the learning that's important, not necessarily understanding of that moment, because your understanding changes in time of your, your situation at that moment your age, you could be in mourning. That changes how you understand things. You know? So everything from just stories, history, morality stories, you know, everything teaches you how to become a well-defined Meskwaki that can live like a Meskwaki, that can exist as a Meskwaki. There's a, I, just like with anybody, with any culture, there's an ideal life. And your culture tries to teach you how to live ideally. Just like Christianity, you know, it teaches its followers how to live ideally in their society, how they're supposed to live and their teachings. Just like with us, we have our own moral codes that teach us how to live ideally as a very good Meskwaki. Until where occurrences that, just like when we send, 
when our young men and women join the military. They're going into the military and we have, it's a different teaching, you know. It's a different life. And sometimes you have to give up what you've been taught to be good. You know, you don't, you don't say to your sons, okay, go be nice, you know. Sometimes they would have to do things that are hard. And that's how come we have a system when our soldiers come back, we have a system of cleansing, cleansing them of that, what they have done, what they have seen, what has been done to them. We try to clean it and let them become fathers, grandfathers in time, you know, things like that. So everything has a teaching and everything has a way to it, I guess. It's, as a Meskwaki, when I look out the window, I go outside, I see my creation. I see the world that was made for me. The sky, the trees, the animals, the birds, everything was made for me. Not to dominate, but to live with. And our religious beliefs are very, very complicated. You know, it would take me hours to explain our religious beliefs. But we do have religious beliefs and it serves, it serves our birth, life and death and our soul, where our soul goes to where we go when we die. And as a, as a rule, <coughs> we're a non-Christian nation. Even though we have individuals that have been Christianized, but as a tribe, we're not a Christian nation. We're a very traditional tribe. We still follow our ceremonial cycle, which is based on seasons. We have our our tribal ceremonies during the fall and spring. That's because that's when we would go or leave our village. Then the winter ceremonies are more family orientated, you know, because they're living in their winter camps. But we do believe in our Creator. Our crea we believe our Creator loves us. He taught us how to speak, how to behave, taught us our morals, our right and wrong, the idea of right and wrong, the idea of being mortal. We're, we are mortal people because we were created as mortal people. We're, we, are, we are conceived then we are born and we die, which is a normal cycle for a human on earth. As Meskwakis, we either exist as mortal beings on earth, live in a mortal life. We get sick, we get hungry, we get thirsty, we, we love and we hate and we do everything as a human because we're human people. Metosananya is that word. We're metosananya on earth. And then after we die, we exist. We still exist as Meskwakis, but we exist as spiritual Meskwakis. We, we, it's just going to a different plane. We leave our mortal body and we become spiritual. We become spirits. But we still are Meskwakis. And we, we live in a different plane of existence. But to explain our religious beliefs, it's the only thing I can say is not shaking rattles, like in the movies. Hollywood has made, made us look silly religiously, but they're very profound. And it deals with faith. Like we believe in Thunderbirds when it thunders. We're not afraid of... When we pray to the Thunderbirds in a thunderstorm, non-Indians assume that we're afraid of the weather. 
we're afraid of the storm, which is far from the case. We're praying to a being that we can't see, but we, but we have faith that exists beyond the visual of the storm. We, we know it's a storm. We know it's thunder and rain. We know the signs of that storm, but we have faith that it's a thunderbird creating it. And that's who we pray to, is the thunderbird. And, I, and there's more instances of that. We, we see, you know, we see trees. And we use trees. We burn trees. We build our wikiups with trees. But even trees have an essence of life. And without trees, we would not breathe. We would not exist without trees because we would all suffocate. And you, that's how come we like trees. We like trees among, around us because they, in a certain way, they exist too. And we live with we live with our environment. We don't, we don't try to dominate it. We don't try to control it. You have to take care of your environment. If your environment dies, then you die. Simple as that. You know, if, if you can't drink your water, if you can't grow food on your land, then, then you die. You know, I'll tell you a story about 20 years ago, we made a history CD, and it won an award. And it was in Atlanta, Georgia, the award ceremony. So we told the people, just put it in the mail. We'll, maybe we'll put it on our wall, you know, maybe. But another, our friends, our non-native friends, told us, no, this is a prestigious award. And you have to go to Atlanta to accept it. You have to put on a suit, shake hands, take pictures, because it's that prestigious. So we, my wife and I, we said, oh, let's, let's go to Atlanta. We'll make a vacation, a week vacation out of it. So we drove down. We left Iowa. We went, went down through Illinois. We went through Paducah, Kentucky, into the south. And we used kettles to cook in, traditional copper kettles. And we thought, hillbillies, there should be kettles all over the place, you know, laying in the yards, you know, they should be cheap. Once we crossed Paducah, we were surrounded by people, thousands and thousands of people. We were never alone within that time, in the car, in the streets, there was people. We went, got an award, then we said, let's get away from the people and go through the Appalachian Mountains. Maybe we'll find peace, mental peace. So we went through the mountains and there's thousands of people in the mountains and we're all going down the mountain at 80 miles an hour. And we finally made it out of that area and we got back to Illinois and it, it felt home, home again, as we came up to Illinois into Davenport, Rock Island area and crossed the Mississippi again and we're more relaxed. Then we thought, we were so scared of those many people. We thought, geez, if something happens economically, climate, anything. If something happens to those people down there, they're going to migrate, and they're going to migrate north. They're going to be on our doorsteps. Thousands of people, desperate people. And we were scared enough to go buy guns in the house, put them in the house. And it's kind of subsided within the 10 years. So today our son uses the guns to go hunt. But at the time, we said we need guns in the house because something happens, those people are migrating north 
into the Midwest. And people don't, this because this genetic memory kicked in of, of being a native people on this continent. That genetic memory kicked in and said, invasion, there's people coming, you can't stop them. You can't stop hungry, desperate people that come to your door. You can't. And that memory kicked in of our past. That's what I mean, is you have to take care of your environment. If you don't take care of your environment, you can't live there anymore. If gas is coming out of your water and you can actually light your water on fire, there's something wrong with your land if you can actually light your water with a match. If you don't think there's nothing wrong with it, there's something wrong with you until it's too late. Then you want somebody to fix it and there'll be nobody to fix it at that time. So I, it subsided quite a bit, you know, but as Indian people, we know what it means when there's people at your gate, hungry, desperate people, dangerous people. You can't stop them. You can't stop that movement. What Europe is experiencing now with the movement in their area of refugees, escaping people, you can't stop them no matter what, you know. So that's my story of you have to protect your environment. You have to pamper your environment. And we have a water system since the 90s. We have a water system. Our water system, when our waste goes into the Iowa River, it's clean water. We have made, this tribe has made a very good waste system that when we put water into the Iowa River, it's cleaner than the Iowa River. Because we believe in that. You know, we believe in, and I'm not saying that we're saints. You know, I, we, we make trash too, just like humans, you know. Being human means you make trash. You know, you make, that's just being human. We're very trashy people, I guess, you know. <laughs> but we make, as humans, we make trash. Like before, I used to get coffee in a paper cup. You know, I'd drink my coffee. At the end of the day, I would throw my paper cup in the trash. And next morning, I come to work. By God, that cup is gone. No, not my problem anymore. It's gone. It's magically gone. It's somebody came and took my cup away to out of my sight. Now I don't have to deal with it. I have a new cup. At the end of the day, I would throw my cup in the trash. Day after day, week after week, year after year. My cups disappeared. Then I realized one day they hadn't. They were someplace. There was a big pile of my cups somewhere that I caused. I did it. I made that pile. I don't, I don't know how big a pile I made, but I made a pile somewhere of paper cups. So I talked to my wife, told her, my little story, you know, she said, she, she said, why don't you start, why don't you just take a cup from the cabinet? You know, that way you use that to put your coffee in. So I said, yeah, I think I'll take a cup to work. So that's what I use today. You know, because some, that one day I realized that somewhere 
was my pile of paper cups that I made myself, you know. So that's, and like I said, we're, we're not, we do make trash as people, but we try, we're, we try not to make too much trash. As human beings, we have to make trash. But as human beings, we should be aware of how much trash we make. Right now, in the Pacific Ocean, is a huge pile of trash floating in the ocean. It's miles long, it's miles deep, the width of it is miles long, and it's miles wide. It's just floating around the ocean. You know, we, we us people, have made a dead, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, things like that. It's, so as a people, I think, and I'm not saying just Meskwakis, but us as humans, we're going to have to start taking care of our little earth because it's the only earth we have. People always like to think they can go away, get on a spaceship, go to another planet, you know, things like that. Or have a God that will come and take you away. You have a belief in a, some God, will, your Savior will come and whisk you away to a better place. But no matter what, we're stuck here. And did you know the planet Earth is the only place where you can make fire? Physical fire, it doesn't exist in outer space. It doesn't exist in other planets. I could go outside and make a fire. That's the Earth is the only place I can make fire. Because of oxygen, fuel, and environment, it makes fire. Other planets has lava, you know, but that's not fire. That's just lava. Fire is that this is the only place where it can make fire. If you think about it, you can't make fire any place else in the universe. There have been great people within the tribe that have done great things. But to say they're the greatest is, I can't do that. It's just like your children. You love your children equally. You know, you can't say this one is, you know, better than this one, you know. It's, and same way with my tribe. I can't say one is, to me, we're all great. So I can't say who. There have been, there have been great people that have done great things, and there have been people that have done ungreat things. There's, I can't answer who is the greatest, because they did it for the time, what they needed to do. Because us Meskwakis, we always come up with leaders that do what needs to be done when it's desperate. Sometimes they're diplomats, sometimes they're warriors. Sometimes it's the common guy that used to live down the street, you know. It's, but we come up with those people when we need them. They always come when we need them. I could name off a bunch of chiefs, but what about the guy that saved the tribe when he woke up in the morning and saw Sue in the woods? His name is unknown. That's just one incident. You know, what was his name? Nobody knows his name, but he woke up the tribe and saved the tribe. And he was just a guy that woke up early in the morning, you know. I can't think of anybody because it would be... Because as a people, we're all equal. It doesn't matter what we do. 
we're all equal. And to say that one is more important is judging his time of being great.